Good evening, everyone. Welcome to City Canyon City Planning Commission meeting January 26, 2022. I now call this meeting to order. Um, will you please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Denise, are you with us? Hello, Hello, I am here. Will you please call roll? I certainly will. Chairman Maloney. Here. Commissioner Clark. Here. Um, here. <laughs> Commissioner Clement. Here. Commissioner Ledoux. Here. Commissioner Moss? Commissioner Suther? Here. Commissioner Smith? Here. All right. All right, thank you. Uh, at this time, I need to ask for an approval of minutes from our October 27th, 2021 regular meeting. Did anyone have any corrections to those minutes? Okay, hearing none, I need a motion and a second to approve those minutes, please. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve the meeting minutes from October. Second. Okay, thank you. Denise, please call roll. Sure, who seconded that? Kirk. Com Commissioner Suther. Okay. Commissioner Clark? Aye. Commissioner Suther? Aye. Chairman Maloney? Aye. Commissioner Clement? Aye. Commissioner Ledoux? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Okay, thank you. Item four, public hearings, uh, 4A. Four Mile Ranch Planning Area C5. This was continued from, are we continuing again? We, we, it was not continued. It, this is the first time it has been noticed for hearing. Um, and in staff's opinion, the engineering on this project is not at a level of completeness where we would be confident bringing it forward for recommendation by Planning Commission. So we are asking that Planning Commission continue this to your February 23rd regular meeting. Okay, so officially I'll ask that we continue this till our February 23rd meeting. Do, do we need to vote on that or just move on? Uh, I would like a consensus opinion for the, uh, the continuance. It, this is having to do with the, keeping the notice active so that the applicant doesn't have to redo the notice in the future. Okay, Denise, can you call roll to approve uh, continuing the Four Mile Ranch planning area C5 to February 23rd, please? Certainly. Commissioner Maloney? Aye. Ch I mean Chairman Maloney, sorry. Aye. Commissioner Clark? Aye. Commissioner Clement? Aye. Commissioner Ledoux? Aye. Commissioner Suther? Aye. Commissioner Smith. Aye. All right, thank you. 4B, preliminary plan, Keystone Ridge subdivision, case number sub 2021-015. I now open this public hearing. The provisions of the city municipal code and in particular title 17 thereof, the subdivision regulations and the comprehensive plan of the city of Canyon City are incorporated into the record of this hearing as if set forth verbatim. Um, looks like, do we have applicants here? At, for right now, I guess we'll start with a staff report, please. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the Planning Commission. This evening, we are here to consider a request by the owner of a parcel located in the 2900 block of South Street to create a new residential subdivision. The request before Planning Commission is a preliminary plan, which is the first step in a major subdivision review. The subject property is a 24.09 acre parcel located at the southeast corner of South Street and what will be the extension of North Reynolds Avenue, north of its current terminus at Juniper Street. The property is currently undeveloped and unimproved with utilities beyond the service mains located around the property and existing rights of way. The site has an active terrain with more than a 46-foot grade differential between the low spot on the property 
uh, near where the property borders the lots along Robbie Lane to a high point at, near the intersection of South Street and Rockefeller Avenue. The property is currently zoned MH1, Mobile Home Park Zone District, which the applicant has indicated they will file to change to R1 low density residential at the time of final plat. Both the MH1 and R1 zone district have a minimum lot size of 6,000 square feet, however, and a minimum frontage along the street of 60 feet, so the same minimums apply in both zone districts. The principal difference between MH1 and R1 is that R1 does not permit mobile homes. The applicant is proposing to create a 68 lot residential subdivision intended for construction of single family homes. <laughs> Under the existing zoning, as well as the anticipated R1 rezoning request, all lots within this subdivision uh, exceed the minimum lot size of 6,000 square feet and 60 feet of lot frontage along a dedicated public street. The applicant has established an internal street network that provides uh, adequate circulation. It also provides two points of access into the subdivision, one from South Street and one from the extension of North Reynolds Avenue. There is no proposed access to Rockefeller Avenue within this subdivision. There are also two uh, detention ponds located at the southeast and southwest corners of the proposed subdivision. The applicant is proposing to complete the subdivision in four phases or filings. Page four of the staff report summarizes the number of lots, acreage for streets, and acreage for stormwater detention ponds within each phase. The internal streets, utilities, and drainage infrastructure associated with each phase will be constructed at the time of final plat approval for each phase. Each final plat will be accompanied by a subdivision improvement agreement that will specify the engineered cost estimate for the public improvements, and the applicant will provide financial security to the city for those public improvements. The city's unified development code provides eight criteria in section 1709010 for the evaluation of new subdivision proposals. Staff has evaluated this proposed subdivision and made findings for each, beginning on page five of the staff report. Under those criteria, staff finds that the proposed subdivision is acceptable and can be considered for approval. Now, in terms of public comment, as of today, staff received no email or, or, or mail concerning this proposal. We did receive one phone call uh, from a resident on, at the corner of Robbie Lane and um, Elizabeth Street, wanting to know more about the timing of this meeting, but they didn't indicate a position on the proposed subdivision. So in terms of a recommendation, staff recommends the Planning Commission following a public hearing on this request, cite the four findings of fact as certification of Canyon City's jurisdiction to act on the preliminary plan proposal for the Keystone Ridge subdivision in section six of the staff report. Staff also recommends that Planning Commission recommend that City Council approve the preliminary plan proposal for the Keystone Ridge subdivision, subject to the referral comments from the city's water department, fire district, and sanitation district. That would conclude the staff presentation. As always, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. The applicant here is represented by uh, Matt Koch from Cornerstone Surveying, and I believe we also have a member of the public who would like to speak this evening. <clears throat> let's, uh, let's start with questions uh, for staff from the commission. No, no questions? Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Koch, would you like to come up and give us some insights as well? Good evening. I'm Matt Koch with Cornerstone Land Surveying. Um, you know, the biggest thing about this subdivision is we want single family residences. Um, it is zoned mobile home park, which allows the single family re residences, but we're going to rezone it so it's, uh, the mobile homes won't be allowed at all in that subdivision. Um, if you look through the plat, uh, hopefully you've noticed that some of the lots are bigger, some are smaller. What we're trying to do, we talked with several, several builders in the area, and some of them want uh, two to three car garages, some want the smaller garages, so we've adapted some of our lots to uh, take care of uh, most of the builders' uh, requirements that they have. Um, other than that, we've gone through all the engineering, we've developed everything with uh, the staff, and uh, we feel that we have a good project here. 
Okay. Any questions for the applicant representative? Yes, sir. Uh, just a quick, quick note. You've got Keystone Loop and Keystone Circle for road names. Uh, just maybe a minor recommendation. The, the general public, I guess, personally being lost in Highlands Ranch on Cherry Lane versus Cherry Court. That, that gets very frustrating, if you will. You know, everybody has to explain, I live on Keystone Loop, not Keystone Circle, every time they describe their house. Just maybe a recommendation to, if you're not set on those names, consider something slightly different for one of them, but okay. that's I'll just check. recommendation, no. Uh, I'll check with my clients on that. All right. Yeah, I live, I live on Circle Drive, and there's west, north, east, same, same concept. I just wanted to applaud this from a council perspective. Um, Affordable housing is something that we as a council have struggled with, uh, and 68 lots over, over this period looks really great. So I applaud that. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm just curious, do you have any idea when you'll start to build? Uh, he wanted to start yesterday. <laughs> um, we'll b start as soon as possible. Um, we've got the phase one and phase two, the final plat. We're going to get that in fairly quickly along with the re uh, rezone. Um, so it's just a matter of building it so we can start selling the lots. So. And the price range, any idea what you're looking at for Don't that? Don't know yet. Um, we need to, to get the appraisals and such back so we can determine that. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Koch. There was someone in the audience that wanted to speak. Yes, sir. Come on up. How are you? I'm good. Please state your name and address for the record, if you don't mind. My name is Victor Talamantes. I live in 2894 Jupiter Street. I was coming using behalf of some of my neighbors, and now he said we're not going to do a mobile home, so we're okay with it. Now, one of the biggest concerns that we have is right next to a school. I don't know you guys will be considering to have a different kind of traffic control for it. Think about school, school buses, kids walking, and that kind of stuff. So I don't know you guys have that in mind. Second one, she's a neighbor over there. Are you planning to do a fence or be protected so that kids don't get into the side? Or what is your idea to try to keep that? It's, it's a busy intersection over there. And I would like to see you guys can think about it too for illumination for nights because it's dark in that area. I live next to it, so. I don't know, you guys can take that consideration. Maybe we need to do some traffic study about it. Yeah. Because it's going to be kind of busy. This is just the preliminary, so they're going to do all those studies before anything gets approved for rezoning and the next steps, of course. Okay. That is all. Thank you for your time. All right. Thanks, Mr. Talamantis. Any other comments from the audience? Any other comments from the commission, staff? No. Okay. All right, so I will then close this public hearing. I'll need a motion and a second based on the findings of fact. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I move that the Planning Commission adopt the four findings of facts as stated in the staff report. Thank I'll you. I'll second that. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Clark. Any further discussion? Denise, will you please call roll? Certainly. Commissioner Ledoux? Aye. Oh, that was Commissioner Clement. I'm sorry, Commissioner Clement. Aye. Jeez. Commissioner Clark? Aye. Chairman Maloney? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Ledoux? Aye. Commissioner Suther? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Okay. Motion passes. Um, we need another. I need a motion and a second to uh, recommend approval to City Council, please. I can do that. I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council for the City of Canyon City approve the Keystone Ridge preliminary plan subdivision subject to the referral comments from the city's water department, Canyon City Area Fire Protection District, and the Fremont Sanitation District as, a con as conditions precedent for the final plat. Thank you. I have a second. Second. All right, thank you, Commissioner Suther. Denise, please call roll. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Suther? Aye. Chairman Maloney? Aye. 
Commissioner Clark. Aye. Commissioner Clement. Aye. Commissioner Ledoux. Aye. All right, thank you and good luck. Keep us posted. Patrick was saying before the meeting that this is the first subdivision since Four Mile. Either Four Mile or Dawson yeah. Ranch, first major residential subdivision in Canyon City in a long time. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. Exciting. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well done. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, on to item 4C. Let me make sure I'm on the right page here. Yes, yes I am. Uh, ordinance amending Title 17 of the Canyon City Municipal Code, amending certain sections concerning the drainage easements, recreational vehicle parks, enforcement, and definitions. This was continued from our December meeting. Correct. Um, so I will, is this a public hearing still? Correct. Okay, and I'll open this public hearing. The provisions of the City Municipal Code and in particular Title 17 thereof, the subdivision regulations and the comprehensive plan of the City of Canyon City are incorporated into the record of the hearing as of set forth verbatim. Can we please have a staff report? Certainly. Mr. Chairman and members of the Planning Commission, this evening we are conducting a public hearing on a draft ordinance which, as written, would make approximately nine changes to the City's Uniform Development Code. Planning Commission members may recall that at the time of the city's UDC adoption this past summer, it was explained that once the code became effective, it may be clear that despite the best efforts of everyone work re reviewing the new code, some items might simply be omitted or be found not to be working as well as intended. So an ordinance updating the code post adoption was going to be a likelihood. This is that omnibus ordinance. The first of these changes involves the reinstatement of language to chapter 17.06 regarding the dedication of drainage easements. The easements allow the city to access important stormwater infrastructure um, for maintenance purposes that might not otherwise be accessible from a street. Under normal processes, these easements would be dedicated to the city via a recorded final plat. However, in the past, not every plat included the dedication language. This didn't change the city's need to access important stormwater infrastructure, but it meant the city had to request the dedication of easements by a separate document on a lot by lot basis at the time of building permit. Without the restoration of this language, the city's ability to require home builders to sign over these easements would be imperiled. The second change proposed adds a definitions for final plat and site specific development plan to chapter 17.13 of the UDC. These definitions are key to the city being able to structure improvement agreements for major subdivisions such as the one that you just heard and site plans where construction of public improvements such as roads, drainage infrastructure and water lines would be necessary to serve the development. Such agreements are very important in that they serve to clarify exactly what public infrastructure a developer will be required to construct or install, cost estimate that construction, and then provide for financial security to ensure that the work gets, gets completed even in the event of a developer default. The next two changes both have to do with modifying certain code requirements for accessory buildings as stated in 17.05.140. As currently written, accessory buildings on lots with more than 10,000 square feet of area are limited to a maximum size of 1,000 square feet. This presents a problem because we already know there are a number of examples around Canyon City with accessory buildings greater than 1,000 square feet. To keep the minimum where it is now would create a whole new category of legal non-conforming lots throughout the city. Staff would like to avoid that, so we are recommending that the limit be increased to 2,000 square feet. Another modification pertains to the spacing between the principal building and any accessory building or structure. It is currently specified as a five foot minimum separation. This ordinance would reduce that to three feet. Again, this is primarily to avoid creating a whole new category of legal non-conforming lots because we already have a situation where given eave structures on some of these, they are already closer than five feet apart. The final modification it makes to accessory buildings is to remove the limit of only one accessory building per lot 
given that, again, there are already a number of lots across the city that have more than one accessory building. Instead, the limitation of building mass in residential lots, rather than being a specific number of buildings, would be a percentage of lot coverage of building area. In this case, 45% of the lot um, could, could have building mass on it, uh, and that would be across all residential zone districts. The fifth change pertains to standards for recreational vehicle parks. In the old Title 17, it was Section 17.20.145 that contained a number of development standards for RV parks that were inadvertently omitted from this new UDC. This ordinance reinstates those standards <coughs> under Chapter 1705, the chapter entitled Use Specific Standards, as a new provision under Section 1705.110, Recreational Use Specific Standards. There are no proposed changes from the old Title 17, Section 1720.145 language. They are merely being added back in here, and they're being added back in here because we have noticed a number of development interests about new recreational vehicle parks in the city, so we'd like to have the restoration of those standards back in place. Staff believes that there is a marked interest in the development community for new RV parks, as I just said. We have observed that the county is certainly getting a number of inquiries regarding RV parks. City also approved an RV park on Mariposa Road in 2019, for which the developer indicates he intends to commence construction fairly soon. This is why it was felt adding these requirements back in was a priority at this time. The sixth proposed change will create a new section within chapter 17.01, General Provisions, with the creation of section 1701.070. This new section adds language pertaining to the city's ability to enforce the Uniform Development Code. Occasionally, staff has had to contact property owners about zoning violation complaints received against a property. Staff's ability to both require the homeowner to bring their property back into compliance with the UDC and our ability to take the property owner to court in the event the property owner refuses to comply would be hampered without the inclusion of this section. And it should be noted that zoning violations are not treated as criminal offenses. They are misdemeanors specifically investigated and where necessary prosecuted as civil offenses and subject only to fines. This section also, propose, also proposes a change to use standards in 1705 in lodging use standards, 1705.070. Currently, paragraph B4 describes rooming or boarding houses, an arrangement where a lodger rents a bedroom within a home. As currently written, these kinds of tenancies are only limited to 30 days when in fact the rentals for such kinds of tenancies are typically much longer than this, long-term rentals of several months. The, this change, the proposed change, would eliminate the 30-day limit on uh, boarding or rooming houses. Finally, an exception is being created within Chapter 1707, the city's sign code, in which murals can be authorized in public areas within the CB Central Business District. Currently, painted wall signs are permitted within the CB zone, but only to a maximum of 30% of the wall plane. This amendment would establish a carve-out for murals. Under this provision, the City Council would establish a mural program. A committee would then be established that would create the rules appropriate for mural design and approve them, but only for display in public areas. The interest in creating this carve-out came about as a result of the city's 150th birthday celebrations, where there is an interest in creating some murals downtown in public spaces. Unfortunately, the size limitation on painted wall signs would prevent those kinds of murals, so this specific carve-out was asked for. Now, that wouldn't conclude the city's, the, the staff reports. Uh, per the notice requirements for text amendments in Title 17, as specified in Table 1710030 C3D, this hearing has been advertised with a published, no, published notice on the city's website for at least 15 days prior to this hearing. And in fact, the continuance from December to this meeting was noted as well. Staff is recommending that Planning Commission recommend that City Council approve the draft ordinance making all nine of these amendments to Title 17. 
That would conclude the staff report. As always, I am happy to answer any questions that Planning Commission may have. Thank you. Looks like we have questions. Go ahead. Uh, Smith. Mr. Smith. Thank you. Um, Patrick, at the end of that, uh, the last one about the carve out, on the next page, it starts talking about barbed wire as a type of fencing. There, there is a discussion we would like Planning Commission to have. Yeah, One of our council members, at the time the UDC was going through its review and approval process this past summer, wanted um, uh, some discussion to be had about the potential for the use of barbed wire, given that it's already being used um, in some large lot areas. Right now, the way that it's written in the code, you can have barbed wire, but it has to be as an attachment on top of some other kind of fence. Right, like a chain link. Oh. This particular council person would like to see the barbed wire added as its own type of fence, and I thought it would be appropriate for Planning Commission to have a discussion about how appropriate it was felt barbed wire as a unique fencing material would be. So the barbed wire is not going to be attached to these draft ordinances that we're talking about no. now. It's just in... It, it's in here for discussion. Okay. Um, because this was one of the items that this particular council person had asked for. Okay. Um, and I was unsure whether or not to have it rolled into this uniform development code or not. If it's felt that the, the barbed wire as a standalone fencing material is appropriate, we can always put together another ordinance and bring it back to you. But I was not sure what Planning Commission's reaction to this would be. Commissioner, right. Thank you. Commissioner Clark. Yes, sir. On the standalone buildings, the accessory buildings, do we want to get into having large buildings on the back side of the lots any more than we do now? I guess my question would be what would be the difference between grandfathering the ones that are there and, and staying with the thousand foot um, existence that's currently in the plan? I mean, you, you can do that. Right now, there are two provisions that are working to control the amount of building mass on a residential lot. One is the size of the accessory building that you can put in and the number of accessory buildings that you can put in. The other is the 45% limit on all residential lots for building mass. I, again, this was something that originated with a council person saying, why would we want to create all these legal non-conforming situations when we know there are already existing situations where we have more than one accessory building and in most cases more than a thousand square feet of area associated with those accessory buildings? Why not just go back to the 45% limit? Again, you can say you think it's inappropriate for that particular section of this draft ordinance if you want and you can strike it from this and that will be the version that goes forward to council without this provision. Staff is saying there's a certain redundancy in having both. It seems to me the simpler thing to do would be simply the 45% building mass limit. Okay, thank you. So um, the 45% building mass limit is what we have in place now? We have both in place now. We're okay. suggesting that what we should do is remove the number of accessory buildings, increase the minimum or the maximum square footage of a building, an accessory building on a lot with more than 10,000 square feet to be 2,000 square feet. For but it's still the 45 percent. But still the 45 percent maximum building at mass would be still in place. In that case, what's the <clears throat> 2,000 square foot represent? It would represent the maximum the size max. for a single accessory okay. building. Thank you. So when this was approved, we knew that it was living and breathing and that there were going to be some changes that have to make it unique to Canyon City. So um, in, in the interest of council, we were trying to simplify things. Obviously, we know there are some things that are going to have to be worked around as we put some of these into use and things trigger other things. So. It, was this staff catches or were there triggers? There were some triggers, but again, some of these items were, uh, had been advocated by council people when we were doing this review. And we didn't include it at that time, but in thinking about it now and with this council person <coughs> renewing their concerns, we thought, okay, as long as we're doing this omnibus ordinance, we can roll this in now. We have in fact seen that 
the, the duplicative nature of these requirements is such that one is becoming more onerous than the other. Let's just go to the less onerous 45% and leave it at that. I'm okay with that. It makes, it makes sense to me. Does it make sense to everyone else? Okay. I had a, um, just a couple of questions about the, the RV park. Um, and so I'm assuming uh, that the RV parks are much different than the campgrounds. Yes. Okay. RV and parks are typically going to provide utility hookup connections. These are spaces that you rent in advance. You can do that online or, or by phone call or depositing of a credit card. Um, but they will have utility hookups and they generally have amenities for the people who will be staying there. So it's sort of like, it's not really a hotel room, but it's almost like renting a lodging space. Okay. And so the amenities, amenities that Amen. you're talking about, um, <laughs> I mean, when we say uh, flush toilets, lavatory showers, laundry facility, um, that's at a minimum that mm -hmm. they're required. Mm -hmm. So things like vault toilets would not be allowed? Um, for an RV park, no. Okay. They're already going to be connecting to um, sanitary sewer. Whether or not, I, I don't know that the city has a prohibition against vault toilets being used in that sort of an arrangement. It would probably be at the behest of the Fremont Sanitation District whether they would allow that or not. My guess is they would probably prefer just a flush toilet system. Okay. And it also mentions um, no uh, fire pits. And so is that, I mean, people who, I'm a camper, and uh, that's like something that everyone likes to have. Is that a, there's a reason for that? Is it because it's inside city limits, or why are we not it, allowing? It, it's partially because it's inside city limits, and it's partially because uh, the, there will be the, the opportunity for barbecue grills, for people to barbecue food. The, the fire pits, to the extent that they're there for warmth, though they will probably be natural gas type fire pits as opposed to live fire pits. So these would probably be higher end RV parks is what we're talking about. That, I think the assumption in the, the RV design standards was that these would be more higher end RV parks. Okay. And these, uh, obviously, we were talking about RV parks within the city of Canyon City. Correct, correct. Okay. And one, once again, another thing that we hear consistently from a council's perspective is that there is not enough RV parking. Um, with our tourism that's around here, we need some place that these RVs can, can park so that they can go downtown or up to the gorge or um, those things. So thank you. Any other questions? I do have a few. <coughs> yes. Few questions. So just for clarification, a, a propane fire pit is allowed? A propane fire pit would be allowed. It's just a wood, natural it, wood burning. Natural burnings. wood burning fire pit would be something we'd want to discourage. As you know, at particular times of the year, fire danger can be quite high here. Okay. Does that trigger anything with the fire district, inspection-wise? or? There, there, there will obviously be inspections in any kind of new structure, any kind of new um, construction that happens. Fire district obviously has a review in that process as well. And then <clears throat> under the RV, the, the item one, section E, section six, which is on page four, it just says uh, all roadways and walkways within the park shall be adequately lighted at night to provide safe access. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would think a you know, dark sky approach to a park would be much more palatable to most people who are there. Um, is, there is there a reason or necessity for that particular statement? Well, we, we do have photometric standards that are now, that now come into play with any kind of a review of a site plan, and RV parks will definitely be considered a type of site plan. Um, now, we don't want to overlight them, obviously, and in, under our standards, not only is there ha they have to have an appropriate um, level of lighting maintained within the pedestrian areas within the subdivision, all lighting fixtures are required to be fully cut off, shielded, and ground directed so that there's no sideways spillage of light or glare off the site. The dark skies um, uh, community requirements I, I don't know how you reconcile that. Um, we could 
go in and strip all of the photometric requirements out of site plans, I would not be uh, recommending in favor of that. I think it's, it's a, safety, a public safety issue myself. And I guess the, the site plan and it's, you know, the, the cutoff and whatnot, but if, if we were to strike this, I mean, then it would be up to the, you know, the owner, if they wanted to light all of the roadways, they could. If they wanted to light only the important areas, they could. But under the current language, it sounds like, you know, any roadway, any walkway, which doesn't seem to actually be defined, would have to be lit. Right. And that, right. And th that, that has not changed from what was in the old code. We're simply putting these standards right back. Right. So if you wanted to address that change, I suppose we could. Again, my concern is you want to make sure that your pedestrian areas are fairly well lit, even in a dark skies community. I think that would be an important safety feature. And I guess I would say, you know, most, and I, I, I typically don't frequent RV parks, but I do camp a lot, but you know, those type of people generally have flashlights, headlights, you know, that can sort of deal with their own lighting more so than a neighborhood type situation, but um, yeah. Uh, if it puts your mind at ease, I can tell you that we probably spent hours upon hours um, looking at lighting, light pollution, um, cut off light, and, and it, was, it was quite an extensive conversation before we came to this uh, conclusion that's in our UDC currently, um, as well as fencing materials. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we really beat some de a, de a dead horse on a lot of these topics. So. Well, I think the, the lighting that's in the UDC is, is great. This requirement of, of having to light everything, not so much. Yes. I would say when they develop an RV park, if that happens, they'll ask for forgiveness instead of permission, maybe. Just, that's a joke. You don't have to comment on it's that. It's a joke. <laughs> I don't know that I have a response to that. No, I, I, I didn't want you to respond. So, so I'm just wondering, um, it, does it, would it help if we just scratched out all, and, and not implying that all facilities have to be adequate, adequately lighted, that just facilities should be adequately lighted? You, you could do that. You could make um, that change. Well, I would, I would think if there's common areas, Patrick's correct, it has to be lit. You can't, you know, I, I, I guess this will, this, can this come up when someone actually proposes a plan for an RV park in the city limits? Sure. Okay. As a matter of fact, that was going to be one of the items on this evening's um, agenda that you continued to February. Um, okay. We do have an RV park that's been proposed. The engineering on that is not ready for it to be brought to hearing yet. Do do we have an existing RV park that could be, re I mean, I, I can't think of anything. Not within the city limits. We don't currently have one. And all the ones up on the eight mile hill are all pretty much closed for the winter, right? So there's no reference there that we can there's go look. Open. I think, I'm not sure about there's that, a, but. There's one that's open. Is there? Down by Indian Springs on 67, is that still open? Or? Maybe we can have a field trip for the next yeah. meeting. <clears throat> okay. If, well, that item, I agree with what everyone's saying on both sides. So I guess that can be addressed when we actually have a preliminary proposal. So are we going to strike the all out of this? Well, um, or just leave it like it is and wait until it comes up. If you don't say, if you just say facilities, that covers it, right? That would be on you public spaces, wouldn't it? It doesn't have to say all facilities. We could leave it a little vague. You could leave it a little vague. When you use the term, if you remove all such, and it just starts with facilities or such facilities, um, I think staff's interpretation would be the major public areas and the major pedestrian areas would still need to be the focus of some sort of a lighting plan. Yeah, I agree with that. So do we want to change the verbiage or leave it as is? I guess I'd say just, just strike the word all. Yeah. So it would read roadways and walkways within the park shall be adequately lighted at night to provide safe access. And that would be non-specific enough yeah that we you know lighting plan can come in and we can say yeah that's that provides adequate or adequate safe access 
Okay. And for, for um, my edification, where, can you cite the paragraph that we're amending so that I can make yeah, that change? Yeah, so page four, it's section, R, under RV, section one, letter E, Roman numeral six. Well, and then, and then uh, I okay. would say also under the sanitary facilities. And, and is that F. is that like inside, you know, inside the facility lit? Yeah. Because oh, that one had okay. do, you know all day and night. And at first I was like, why are you lighting? It? But it's in. I read okay. it as inside of a facility. That which would make sense. the daytime thing a little so, more. So top of page four, Roman numeral six. Correct. Strike the word all. I'll just say roadways and walkways within the park, et cetera. Okay. Any, other, any other concerns? We're not getting back to the barbed wire thing? Well, I, I would say let's, oh. let's treat that as a separate discussion. And I agree. Yeah, well, where, where, would it, where, where would a barbed wire fence be appropriate? How, how would someone want to use that as a standalone fence? Are well, we there's talking a, about? There's a lot of them in town, but they're around farm fields and industrial areas and stuff like that when you get into the residential area <laughs> yeah why well, I, I don't it's yeah. like it says in here it's not aesthetically pleasing i mean it doesn't well it's a, it's a physical hazard if it's anywhere near a sidewalk an alley or anything like that yeah i mean honestly are we starting to discuss it now well no. look, can, okay can, can we have a motion and a vote on the ordinance first okay <laughs> We don't have to make all our corrections first. Okay. <laughs> Great. Don't. Are we Do making it. the one on the motion the one to strike the word all in section E? Or th so that's part of the motion right now. Okay. So at this time, uh, I need a motion and a second as amended to um, recommend to City Council the attached draft ordinance with the correction. I can, I can make okay. that. Uh, I move that the Planning Commission recommend City Council adopt the attached draft ordinance making nine modifications to the city's Title 17 Unified Development Code with the sh striking of the word all in the RV section as discussed. Um, I'll second that. Okay, thanks, Commissioner. That was Commissioner Clark seconding. Any further discussion? Denise, will you please call roll? Sure, Commissioner Ledoux? Aye. Commissioner Clark? Aye. Chairman Maloney? Aye. Commissioner Clement? Aye. Commissioner Suther? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Okay. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, I don't know if you realize, but there is an attendee um, with their hand up. It's home. Is there someone online that. Uh, can you put your speaker on? Oh, they're muted. We'll give it a shot here. If we can't, if we can't hear you, please contact the Patrick, Patrick with your question or concern. He's trying to. I just thought maybe it was our missing commissioner. I don't know, but maybe they got on and hopped off and left their computer on. Did we approve that? We yes, we did. I think we did. Should we move on, Patrick? Uh, yes, the discussion about barbed wire. Yeah, item number, f oh, okay, back to the barbed wire. <laughs> so I can't think of a reason why it would be allowed other than for agricultural uses? We, and and I, as I pointed out to people who are actually surprised to learn this in some cases, the city does not have an agricultural zone. We have in R1 and RL, our low density residential, agriculture as an accessory use um, to a residential function on the lot. Um, and I think the intent is in some of these larger lot areas, um, the barbed wire may be an economically more realistic um, type of fencing than, um, say, a six-foot wood privacy fence or some sort of a split rail fence. 
Um, and I, I get that. Uh, yeah. Myself, I guess I have to raise the question, from an aesthetic standpoint, is this a type of fencing that the city ought to be allowing? And I think as planning commission members, you probably have more insights into the answer to that question than I would. I understand that some people probably want it as a security measure if they've got a large lot and they can't see the back area and there's people, you know, maybe living back there, whatever the case may be. But I'd hate to see someone in a residential neighborhood put a barbed wire fence up around their backyard. So how do we, how do we allow it for a certain use but not for another? I don't know the answer to that question. If it's an allowed fence material, then it's allowed, period, in any residential area. Can we tie, tie the use of three-strand barbed wire to the size of, of lot? I mean, in the, in the proper setting, it seems reasonable. If, if you have a big enough lot to run cow, barbed wire fence seems reasonable. I, I think you could. You know, what, a, what square footage would you think would be appropriate? What is, what is the current ordinances on, on livestock? I mean, current ordinances on livestock are you have to have a minimum one acre to have um, uh, cattle or horses or whatnot. And then for every additional half acre you have, you can add one more animal. So it seems like if, if we could tie three-strand barbed wire to that, that same, you know, it can only surround, you know, one acre or larger okay. type. Yeah, I mean, that's better, yeah. But, you know, your typical six to 10,000 square foot city lot, it seems inappropriate. Because okay. it will happen. If someone knows they can do that, someone will do that. So, but I like Brian's solution. Sure. Well, we, we, can, we can link it to, um, un, under fencing materials, you know, three-strand barbed wire at, say, four-foot height or something like that, um, provided that the lot is a minimum of one acre in area. Was the, was the question um, proposed based on what's already existing? Yes. Okay. Do we know what size lot is being specifically referenced? I would have to research that. I do not know what lot was specifically being referenced. Yeah, and I guess I'm thinking the, the lot behind Fire Station 2, so 15th and I guess Harding, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's an entirely appropriate place for barbed wire, but. So, so is the question to, is from council is the question to make sure that these people that have existing barbed wire fences are in compliance with our existing code on it? I think the question was, we know that these situations exist now. Do we want to create a new category of legal non-conforming uses, or do we want to create a situation where under certain circumstances these uses, that this, this type of fence material would be appropriate, and therefore it negates the need for creating a legal, a category of legal non-conforming use. So, so the lots that currently have Bob wire, do they currently have lobs, livestock on those lots? That I don't know. I would have to research this. Not I simply all of them. don't know. I can tell you for a fact, not all of them do. Some of them are hay fields. Some of them are, there's, there's different uses. Some of them are just residential houses with the back part by the alley with a barbed wire fence on it. And there's a couple off of 9th Street that I'm aware of. No, that's residential, yeah. Because they're using that as a barrier from the alley to their property. Um, and these there's, are? There's, a one, there's one dead end alley that at the end of the alley there's barbed wire and it's, they're all residential lots. Did it's it exceed dead. one acre? Or? No. Yeah, so, so if, if the eight, one acre was a, was a criteria then these would not? Correct, but yeah. they exist right now. Right, right. They've probably been there for a while. Oh, yeah. All right, so until they pull a permit to build a new fence, they can keep what they have. We would probably not make targeting of non-conforming fences of this kind of material a priority for enforcement. That'd probably be a good idea. <laughs> yeah, we just don't want to encourage it as a fence style in yes. a residential neighborhood. Yes. Okay. Well, and my fear is that once it, once there's a, once there's something that triggers this, it's going to create a firestorm of do I have to take my fence down or do I have to put one up kind of situation. No, I think that's unavoidable. One. The answer would be no. Yeah. At some point there will be a trigger, yes, but I think that's unavoidable. So, 
So I'm wondering, uh, why can't we just leave it the way it is? If, you, if, you have that option. You have yeah. that option. If you leave it the way it is, staff's interpretation would be that barbed wire is only appropriate in those kinds of industrial zones or, or the, these, these other kinds of uses where for security reasons you have a three-strand barbed wire attachment to some other kind of fence at the top of the fence, um, you know, like a concertina wire right. um, on top of a chain link fence, for example. And the people who currently have barbed wire fences, though, would be allowed to keep them until they want to change their fence. The, we would keep them. I mean, I don't know that we would make enforcement of you, you've got to go in and change this fence material because it's not allowed. I don't think we would make that a priority. But it would put these folks in the category of having a legal nonconforming fence type. And if they ever wanted to change, you know, make some... Uh, additional area of yard that they wanted to enclose, the city would tell them at that point, you now need to come into compliance with our fence requirements, which means barbed wire is not an appropriate material. That would be the consequence. And that's already in place right now. That would be, if nothing were to change, that would be the consequence, yes. Hmm. So the trigger is going to exist one way or the other. Well, not really, because uh, they can replace their barbed wire fence with a barbed wire fence. I mean, Not if depending it depending on it, what they're it, doing, if they no, need we're a permit, talking about if the barbed wire fence. Is if if they can if they had to come to the city to obtain a permit for any kind of a fence, fence section that they're replacing, at that point we would tell them, well, you now need to come into compliance with the fencing code more generally. I'm sorry, I missed that. So you're saying if they want to replace like a portion of it, they would, because it got torn apart for whatever reason, they mm -hmm. would have to replace it with the new stuff. Correct. Oh, okay. All right. I would be an upset landlord if I, I had and, to do and that. I, I imagine, but there's an aesthetic question that this raises, and I figured right. this is the forum to have this conversation. So we're talking about looks. That's what aesthetic. Well, and safety. safety. I mean, function. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, Stop a little that. kid running through there. Right. Yeah, we, we, you know, we just. Well, we if just I heard him correctly, this started, this conversation started over a looks issue, not a safety issue. I, well, it's both. Well, I agree, it's both. <clears throat> well, What's, my opinion is there's a place to have barbed wire for a reason, security or livestock or whatever the case may be, and then. There's a place where you don't want a barbed wire fence. So. We can certainly tie it to parcels that are at least one acre in area. I think that would be an easily enforceable provision. I, I like that idea. And then people that have it, it's obviously they can keep it unless they have to rebuild a new fence and then they'd be out of compliance. So I'm okay with that solution. I don't see it being a problem. You have that done with all kinds of fencing material. Some of the fencing material that's existing really isn't permitted anymore anyway. <laughs> so it's not just barbed wire. Yeah. Do we have to do anything else with this topic? I, I, I think, you know, show of hands, if you're in favor of changing this provision so that barbed wire can be the principal fencing material on parcels that are over one acre in area, we can we can go we can move forward with that and craft something and bring that back to you as an ordinance. I say yes to oh, that. Can I ask another sure. question, Mr. Chairman? So can we refine it even because I can just see people that have an acre lot and it's residential putting up bob wire and that's not what you want. It's really designed for for like we said the hay fields or people that have livestock and so I mean is there a way that that somehow the ordinance addresses that and then it's not you you can put um, uh, and a both and provision in there so it would be both one acre and has agricultural or livestock as an accessory use I would like to see that I thought that was okay oh, I'm sorry I thought that was already in that provision as far as the land use part well, the, the land use didn't encompass the scope of, you know, the keeping of livestock. It was going to okay. be tied to the acreage. Okay. We can do both and, and make sure that that's written in there as a, as a both and statement. So if they really wanted a barbed wire fence on their one acre lot, they could go buy a goat. Absolutely. And they would, then it would, it, would be a, it, would, it would be good. You could just get So I'm, I'm just being 
You, you could know, just get chickens. You don't yeah. need to go. A what? Chicken? Chickens. I, I don't know that chickens will qualify as hooved animals. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's, for, for the sure. sake of beating a dead horse, like Brandon would say, um, I like Commissioner Clements, what, we, what she just said. The both and statement? Yes. Okay. So I would say, and we're not deciding on anything. You're, 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 you're not voting on an ordinance. You're, okay. you're giving us some direction for how to craft an ordinance that we can then bring back to you. Is everyone okay with crafting that ordinance that way that we just discussed? Yes. Okay. Mr. Clark is yes. Okay. So everyone, yes? Brian? Okay. So you have um, a consensus we, we, we that we're okay with that. We have a consensus okay that. direction. Yes. Okay. All right. Anything else on uh, that topic? So your, your 2022 planning commission uh, calendars are in your packet. Um, a little bit of housekeeping item. I believe that there are two planning commission members whose terms will be expiring this summer, and I will be reaching out to those planning commission members later, um, probably in, in February or March, to let you know and ask if you would like to seek reappointment so we can get that taken care of before the June time frame rolls around. I don't know. Can I make a recommendation on that? Would you change that color for the second deadline date? that whatever it is, fuchsia or whatever prints off on that. The second color, you, what, like, you mean the red? The column. <laughs> I don't know if it's, I, don't, I didn't bring the thing with me. It, well, it doesn't come out red on every printer because I went to two different printers and it comes out almost just, like a fuchsia. Just, just print think, it black and white. I, yeah. I think you're out would, of ink. Would you like me to print yeah, it? No, I'm not out of ink. <laughs> I, I don't care. It was just a recommendation. You can have mine if you'd like. sure. No, I, I got it. It was just tough to read at first. Is everyone okay with that with that calendar for this year? Any any changes? To your didn't come out red either. Oh, she's. No, I don't think anyone. I think everyone's okay with it. Okay. And that's that's the conclusion of staff's business, unless. Um, Planning Commission members have anything you'd like to discuss? Any announcements or anything to talk about from any commissioners? I have one announcement. Um, I've already made this at council, but um, Kangan City Youth Baseball will be doing their annual Rigatoni fundraiser at Doritos Restaurant February 20th. Food starts serving at 11. Um, this is one of our biggest fundraiser for youth baseball, so please attend. Ten bucks to get in the door. You get a heaping pile of rigatoni and meatball and a sausage and salad and bread, and it just keeps going. So everybody come out and support the youth baseball program. Thank you. You can probably charge 12 or 15, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, Denise, for being on. Uh, thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.